Man, I tell you what, don't, uh, uh, let me say this. I bet y'all probably like, man, ooh, preacher going to go long today. No music. <laughs> but, you know, hey, this, so, man, again, I just want to say welcome. And and I don't take this privilege lightly. It's, it's a privilege for me to, one, wake up and have the breath of life. Because somewhere, somebody didn't wake up today. And that I get to share the good news of Jesus Christ with his people. Man, that's awesome. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, and, and man, we're going to have a great time. And it's looking a little bit different, but that's okay. Different's okay. Because here's the thing, the truth of the matter is this. This never changes. Amen. The way we get it to people may change, but this itself never changes. Uh, and just to let you know, the praise team, there, there's a couple of them. When you got two or three of them out, uh, you know, we holding it down while y'all on the beach, you know. I don't eat, you know, but uh, we're, we're so thankful for them, and, and, and they're taking a, a break today. I know this. You do not want to miss next Sunday. You do not want to miss next Sunday. You know, and, and if you are a guest of ours, one of the things I hope that you come away with today is this. Man, those people worship the Lord. Amen? That those people worship the Lord. And I know when we think of worship, we think that, you know, wait a minute. Let me tell you something about worship. Worship's more than singing a song, okay? It's part of it, but worship's more than singing a song. Can I tell you, worship is praying, but it's more than that. Worship is preaching and teaching the Word of God, but it's more than that. Because what you and I like to do is we like to just, we like to put God in a box at times. And where we, if we were all honest with each other, when we hear the word worship, we think music, right? And that's it. Worship is so much more than that because my desire today is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's my desire we do that every time. Let me tell you this about worship. Worshiping God is not just limited to Sunday. Worshiping God must happen every day with everything that you have. Amen? So, so for you to properly receive the word. We hope that your hearts are open, your minds are open, but we've hoped that that from Saturday all the way from, from Monday through Sunday, we, we hope that you've been worshiping God. Because if, if this is the only time that you've set aside in the week to worship him, then you're likely going to be let down. Right? You ever heard that what you put in, what you get out? What you sow is what you reap. So we have to be sowing all week to prepare ourselves for what God has for us. Because worshiping is, is every day, and it's with everything you have, everything you are. Worship is your whole being. And that's the only reason that we're here today. So what I want you to do is go ahead, turn in your Bibles. We're going to be in First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 4, right? And we're in this series called Living Hope. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to begin with verse 7, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But we're in this series called Living Hope, and it's this right here. It's that, you know, people, the world needs to see the hope of glory that resides in those who believe and follow Jesus Christ. They don't need to see anything else. They don't need to see that you can put on a nice outfit. They don't need to see that, man, you can dress it up and look good. What they need to see is the hope of glory that resides in you because when the world comes crumbling in on you, when, when everything's come crashing in, I mean, that's, that's what really thrives. And God not only thrives in the good times, he thrives in the bad times. And he thrives in those times that are in between. And this series has been nothing short of amazing. Because what we've, what we've learned is, and we looked at it last week, was in view of Christ's suffering. And when you and I think of the suffering that Christ endured, how can we not be all in? Amen? How can you and I not be all in? Because let me tell you this, he was all in for you. It wasn't part of him. It wasn't almost all of him. It wasn't 99%. He was all in for you and I. And Christ endured suffering. He endured it leading up to the cross. And when you think about the cross, the most excruciating death anybody could die. He endured that. He endured through the grave on into eternity for you and I. 
the way that Christ suffered and what he endured were for you and I. But you know what? This life for you and I, as we looked at that last week, life's a battle. Come on, we got to fight every day. It's a fight for you and I. We got to fight every day. And here's what we learned last week. The thing that stuck out to me about this battle is this right here. A lot of believers are defeated by sin because they're not willing to sacrifice anything in the battle against sin. Amen? Basically what they're saying is, church, something's got to give. Okay? You can't keep continuing to do this but desire to have this. Something's got to give. You can't say, Lord, why, why do things seem so empty? Why am I not where I, I, I think I should be? And, and, and why am I not defeating this? Why am I not, man, I keep struggling with the same sin over and over and over again. Lord, I find myself coming back to you asking forgiveness for the same thing. You got to sacrifice something in the battle. You got to give up something. And, and whatever that is, you need to give it up. And, and for, for us today, where we're going today is you cannot misunderstand this scripture. If you misunderstand where we're going today, you've totally missed the whole message. And it'll really, it will just get you off point. I mean, we're looking at this right here, living hope. This is part nine of this series. And it's this right here. It's twofold. We're going to look at serving for God's glory. And we're going to look at praise in the pain. Amen. Because when you serve for God, God's glory, guess what you can have? There is praise in the pain. No matter how deep, no matter how much it cuts, there's praise in the pain. And what we're going to look at today is, 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 is this Peter's going to instruct us to look at things with the end in mind. And the end in mind for you and I is not necessarily the end of our life. It's the end in the sense of the second coming of Christ. Because that's what we're waiting on. We're waiting on that. we got to look at this. we got to endure suffering with the end in mind. You and I have to live obedient in light of the return of Christ because I know for a fact he's coming back. Amen? And I need to live my life in such a way that Christ is coming back. And the thing about this is Christ's return, it's imminent, which means it could happen any time. I mean, we could be in the middle of the best 10 10 yet, and his return happens. And you know what? At that time, it's too late. You're either his or you aren't. And so we got to live that way. We got to take this thing serious for you and I. But there are some things in the Christian faith, before we get to reading this, that, that's going to help us, and it, it'll help kind of get us going in the right track, and it's this right here. The, for the Christian faith, the world is not all that there is. Amen. Can we, can we get along with that? This is not all there is. For those that believe and follow Jesus. Okay? It, it's, this is not it. And the other thing is this. This world is not the believer's home. Amen? This is not the home that you and I were designed for. We were designed for glory. Amen? Now, whether we, whether we see that it, it, it is up to what we do with Jesus. What we do with, with the, his death, burial, and resurrection, whether we believe that, whether we take hold of that. The other thing is this right here. Believers have a guaranteed future with God. Now, remember where we're going today. We're talking about serving for God's glory and praising the pain. You and I, as believers, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ, then you have a guaranteed future with God. What's the other side of that? If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, and this is the truth. A lot of people don't like to preach on this. This is the truth. If you're not a believer, then you have a future eternally separated from God. Amen? That, that's the word. The other thing is I love this right here. Believers have the opportunity to serve each other and tell others about Christ. Church, that's a great opportunity. That's a great opportunity. Thing for you and I that we get to do. We get to serve each other and we get to tell other people about Jesus. Not about you, not about what Encounter is doing, not about what a specific church is doing, but we get to tell other people about Jesus. So let's go. Here we go. First Peter 
chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says this. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And what you can't do, you can't be thrown off there when it says, but the end of all things is at hand. Now, we're not talking about end in a chronological sense. What that's talking about is really the consummation of God's plan. It's, it's the end is at hand, and it's going to happen. And that's, the way it's, it, that's important to know that ultimately God's goal is going to be accomplished, and the Scripture's telling us, but the end of all things is at hand. Is that when everything will be put to rest. And the thing, it could happen any time. That's important for you and I. So guess what it says there? It could happen any time. So guess what you need to do? You need to be serious and you need to be watchful. Because when you live in light of that, when you live for his return, you will be serious and you will be watchful. And it says do that. In your prayers. And, and, and what Peter's trying to get us to do is, sometimes in this life, we get carried away with things we're passionate about. Come on. Or we get carried away with a lot of things that, that get our emotions stirring. What he's saying is don't get off track. Don't get carried away by your passions and emotions. You need to live in light of that you, the one who created you, the one that saved you, he's coming back. We need to live in light of that. And that we need to take that serious. And then when you look at verse 8, I love this there in the beginning, above all things. Church, that's important. Here's why above all things is important. So it's above whatever gender you came in with this morning, it's above that. Whatever preference you have, it's above that. Whatever you thought you wanted today to be about, it's above that. It says above all things. Whatever you're uncomfortable with, it's above you being uncomfortable. He said above all things, and I love this word here, have fervent love for one another. Have fervent love for one another. We're told, Throughout scripture. How will they know that you're my disciples? This is where you take part. How will they know that you're my disciples? Your love for one another. And here Peter says. You're to have a fervent love. Fervent there is to be stretched. To be strained. As almost you know if I was to go to gym right now. I'd be hurt. Like, you know, when you strain your muscles and you stretch them, whether you're training or you're running or you're doing any kind of physical activity, that's what fervent is here. We're to have a fervent love for one another. Well, what does this kind of love require? Brother Mike, what, kind, what does this require? I love what John MacArthur said about this. It says this, this kind of love requires the Christian to put another's spiritual good ahead of his own desires in spite of being treated unkindly, ungraciously, or even with hostility. Amen? See, I told you this wasn't about you. Amen? You see that? Because here's what we do, and we suppose and we claim that we're believers and followers of Christ. What, how we treat, we treat people depending on how they treat us. Right? It says there, you're to put... The Christian is to put another spiritual good ahead of them, no matter how they treat you. And if we're honest with each other, some people have really dogged us out. Amen? And if you turn that around, come on, you probably done dogged some people out. I mean, that love right there, do you have that kind of love? Because I'll tell you what, that's the love Christ has. Amen. See, he tried to pass the cup. It hurt. And he, 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 he went on through. The father didn't let him pass it. I, I love this right here. Don't miss this. Grudem said this about love. 
where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion. Every action is liable to misunderstanding and conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delight. Satan loves when you and I don't show any love because look what happens. That's a hard truth. Think about that. When, when, when love is lacking, there's misunderstanding, there's conflicts. That's why sometimes I hate texting because it is so misunderstood and gets carried away and that's what we resulted to to resolve everything, right? And here's what we even done. We even go, we even go to social media trying to resolve something. Man, I'll tell you what, this is just a fact. If, if it really wasn't for church and us having a Facebook page and different social media, uh, social media outlets, I probably wouldn't have Facebook. We have to show love. We don't need to have love lacking. Look at this, 1 Peter chapter 4, 9 and 10 says this. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. When you think about serving for God's glory, are these two verses, are they part of your characteristics? Are they part of what describes you when you think about serving for God's glory? And I know what some of you are saying. Well, Pastor Mike, I got verse 9 down. I'm hospitable to my family. No, it says to one another, I'm hospitable. And then there's probably some of you to say, you know, uh, that's just that's just not a gift that the that the Lord has given me. No, that that's not a gift. He's told you to be hospitable to one another. And I know what you're saying. I ain't got no problem. I'm I'm, I'm hospitable to my Christian brothers and sisters. But the hospitable here is something different. The Greek word here for hospitable is a love of strangers. Uh oh. That is for you to it, it, it's kind of like taking in travelers, taking in strangers, and this is talking about opening your home. That's what it means in the Greek. As believers and followers of Christ, are we open on our home? And not only are we to open our home, but it says without grumbling. Man, I really don't I love when I love when people come to my house and <laughs> We get to clean up, <laughs> you know. Hey, I got a good excuse now. We're still living out of boxes. We just moved. So you might have to sit on a box. You can't sit in a chair, but you can sit on that box. You know, but, but think about this. You're to do it without grumbling. So you can't be hospitable and then fuss about it. The, the two go hand in hand. That's what the scripture says there. You're to open your home without grumbling. And what grumbling is, grumbling is displeasure. Okay? Grumbling is displeasure. Grumbling is basically the opposite of being cheerful. But when you go down and when we take a closer look, that's verse 9. When we go down and you take a closer look at verse 10, I love this. Verse 10 takes away every excuse that you and I could have to serve God through the local church. Takes away every excuse. As each one has received a gift. As each one has received a gift. So when it comes to serving God, you don't have an excuse. Because the scripture tells us as each one has received a gift. Everybody in here. We can go from one end of the property to the next. Everybody in here has a gift. Each one of us has received a gift. And guess what you're to do with the gift? Minister to one another. Amen? You're to use it to minister to one another. So, so if you're a seat warmer, you're not supposed to be that. Everybody in here has a gift. 
Now, one gift I don't have is I don't, I don't even get to make tea at my house, so don't ask me to make it any function. We have her because you might have grounds in it. You, it might be left on the stove for a little while, but everybody in her has a gift. Everybody has a gift. You don't get to just sit in the seat. Amen? you got to use your gift. What happens with a gift if you don't use it? You lose it. You know, you you got to use your gift. You have to use that, and here's why you use your gift. It's not to puff you up. Amen? It's not to say, ooh, man, look me, I'm gifted. It says minister to one another. That means your gift is used to serve others and be a benefit to them. Amen? That's your gift. And I love this. If you thought verse 10 was done, it's not done. It says as good stewards. You know what stewards are? Stewards are managers. Okay? Stewards are managers in a sense. They're managers. And here's the thing. What a steward manages doesn't really belong to them. They're just over it. So the gift that you have, the gift that God has given you, it's on loan from God. And it's not yours to decide I'm going to use my gift today. I don't feel like it, Lord. I'm not going to use my gift today. It's not yours to decide when and how you use it. He give it to you to use, and it says to minister it to one another as good stewards. And I know this. You are who you are. I am who I am. By the grace of God, none other. And Scripture backs that up. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. See, I never did anything. He did it all. Amen? It's by the grace of God that I am what I am, and I am who I am by him. It's not I. So you are who you are by the grace of God. Are you stepping into who he's called you to be? Are you stepping out of it? 1 Peter 4, 11 says this right here. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Right? You realize how powerful this verse is? I'm going to try to stay in my little box so the camera can see me, but if I get outside the box, it's okay. I got outside the coach's box one time, got thrown out of a game. That was in my former years. <laughs> But, you know, it, it's, it's this right here. This is what God said. What Peter's telling them is whether you speak, whether you minister, it doesn't matter why you do what you do. Here's, here's what really matters. Why are you doing it? What's the goal of doing it? We didn't go to St. Benedict's and, and go, hey, look at what Encounter's doing. Check us out over here. We didn't do that. We went to serve. Because that's where God called us and that's where God put us. And I'm going to tell you this. I, I won't name this person, but they know who they are. We had an individual serve at St. Benedict's that had been to this church one time and served and bought her family. That spoke to my heart. Amen? Because it, 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 it's, it, it's powerful. Here's the thing. I don't care whether you serve on first impressions whether you serve in EK, whether you serve in E3, whether you serve uh, as, as an elder, whether you serve on the leadership team, whether you serve in the sound and media, and if I've missed anything, it doesn't matter what area you serve in, it's why do you serve? Why? What's the goal? What's the goal of all those ministries? And he says it right here, that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why we serve. It's the work of God. Nothing's too small. Nothing's insignificant for God. Amen? You might say, man, I just, I'm, I'm not really great at anything. You're great at something because he gave it to you. 
He gave it to you. You know what? Well, Pastor Mike, what about when it gets hard? Right? If life gets hard, right? It's okay. Because guess what he says there? He says, as with the ability which God supplies. See, you don't lean on you straight. He did, he's the one that gives you the ability to do what it is he's called you to do. Amen? But when you rely on your own strength, guess what happens? Bloop. That happens. It, it, it's not your strength. It's God's strength. And here's the thing. When we serve for God's glory, guess what the watching world sees? They see this right here. They see dedicated Christians build their lives on truth, humility, holiness, and desire to glorify God. And I know what you're saying. Now, I don't want you to take me wrong. It says holiness, right? It didn't say perfection. Okay? It didn't say, because here's the thing, we're, we're not perfect in here. We're imperfect people. Right? We're in the perfect place under God. But that's what they see. When you live for God's glory, when the goal of what you do is to bring Him glory, here's what they see, dedicated Christians. Truth, humility, holiness, and a desire to please God. A desire to please God. So what do you do with your gift? Right? You don't know your gift? We can kind of help you discover that. But what do you do with your gift? It matters. Because here's what happens when you don't use it. David Jeremiah said this right here. We all have a gift from the Lord. And if we do not use it, his work is weakened and his heart is grieved. We all have a gift. If we do not use it, his work is weakened. And here's why. We're all created by him, for him, and we're to reflect that image. Where can Satan get to God the most? Where can he hurt him the most? Through us. That's where he can hurt him the most. And I can tell you this. The more you get to fulfilling what God's called you to do, just know that Satan's coming 24-7, full court press. You get no break. Amen. That's why, it's, that's why it's important to stay attached. That's why it's important to link up. You see, a, a, a wolf never really attacks a pack of sheep. There's always one lagging behind somewhere. And guess where they go? They go out to that one sheep. Well, if you watch, I, I love Discovery Channel. I like watching lions and in their element shape. But guess what they always do? It's always one lagging behind. And guess what? That's what they go after. They don't go after the pack. That's why community groups are important. That's why it's important for you to belong to a community group and get in and do life with people. And you might say, there's not one for me. Well, it is for you. Come on, let's start. Let's talk about it. You can start one. We got a young man get ready to start a men's group. It's going to kick off, I think, April the 29th. And if you're a man in here and you're not in a men's group or you're not even in a group period, Mr. Josh Krieger is going to start a men's group. And I thank God for that. You know why? We have two women's groups right now, zero men's. I thank God for that. So we got we, we to do what we've been called to do. We all have a gift. Let's use it. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 says this. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Man. Now, here's, here's what you got to know. Now, you got to know that, that the writing of this letter, when Peter wrote this letter, it, it, it was believed to be at the time that, that Rome was burnt. And, and in that, what would this period would begin Persecution for about 200 years. A persecution of 200 years and, and the burning of Rome. So you got to understand, fiery would hit home with them. It would hit home with his audience. It would hit home with Peter. Uh, and, and, and they would be able to identify with this. And here's, here's what I love about this. Is it says, do not think it is strange. Church, which means we know it's coming. We know what's coming. We know the fiery trial is coming. We know that test is coming. So he's saying, don't think it's strange. 
And here's the thing. Not only do we know it's coming, we know what's going to happen. It's going to try you. That means it's going to test you. It's going to stretch you. It might even bend you a little bit, but don't break. I mean, I, I, I go back to this. Man, when I lost my mom at 48, I thought my world came crashing down. Oh, I bent. I didn't break. I thank God for that. I didn't break. I thank God for that. Even as this, you cannot break. There are going to be times that try you. And I, I, I mean, doesn't it seem like this, it, it, you know, in the good times, it seemed like the church is stagnant and complacent. Can we say, you know, when things are going good, it's stagnant and, and, and complacent. But you know this, it, it seems like when times are hard, it seems the church becomes more strengthened and it grows. If you don't get anything else today, don't miss this. C.S. Lewis said this right here. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. See, what you're going through, your pain and your struggle, it's just not about you. God can use that to speak to other people. Amen? He can use that. And I know, you know, when you're talking about serving for God's glory, and then, Pastor Mike, you just don't, man, there's been a lot of pain, there's a lot of hurt. I mean, you know, we just in our city. I mean, I looked on social media, and I'm like, man, it's, it's a, Shooting over here, or shooting over here, and then it's gunshots over here, and it's gunshots over there, and it's, man, it's, it's happening. It's a struggle. And what you struggle with is not necessarily all about you, but it's about what God wants to do in and through you to rouse a deaf world. Because I don't know if you check, man, we, we're not the majority anymore. Christians are not. I mean, that term Christian was strong a long time ago. And I know this, praise and the pain is possible when you accept that painful trials are to be expected. We have to accept that. We cannot go through this life and think, man, whew, boy, everything going good. Painful trials are to be expected. You can have praise and the pain when you expect trials, and that's because it comes as no surprise. It didn't catch you off guard. He's already told us what's going to happen. It's no surprise we're going to suffer. And here's the thing. As long as you're suffering for the advancement of the gospel. Amen. It's not now. Here's the thing, though. We're not talking about suffering and you, you doing them evil things. If you're suffering for doing wrong or if you're suffering for being an evildoer, that's on you. We're not talking about that kind of suffering. And we got to realize the reason this is going to happen, the reason there are going to be pain, because we live in a lost world with lost people. Amen? We live in a lost world with lost people. And here's the thing. Some suffering you may be able to identify with. Some you may not be able to identify with. And some you're going to say, man, I just can't imagine that. But God can. Know for a fact suffering's coming. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 and 14 says this. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory, and the God rest upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Man. How are you to view the fiery trials that come your way? Rejoice. How are you to view them? You're to rejoice. Well, what are we to rejoice in? Rejoice in the fact that you partake in Christ's suffering. That's what the scripture says. Rejoice in the fact that you partake of Christ's suffering. And here's the thing, as long as you're suffering for what is right. Again, when you suffer for what is wrong, that's on you. But when as a believer and follower of Christ, when you suffer for what is right, it, it, scripture said, man, there's, there's a certain camaraderie that you have with him. And the scripture says that you partake in Christ's suffering. And here's the reason it's possible for you and I to partake in Christ's suffering when we suffer for what is right. Because Christ partook humanity when he stepped down from glory. When he stepped out of glory and came down as a man. 
That's how we can partake in His suffering. And we know this, His full glory won't be revealed on earth to a second coming. And that's the day we wait for. That's what we hope for. But, but it, it's, it's possible. Praise and the pain is possible when we know our reward is certain. Amen? When we know that our reward is certain, I'm certain of that. Warren Wiersbe said this, those who suffered more in Jesus will rejoice more at his coming in glory. Amen? What are you rejoicing in? It, 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 it pains me to think about what they did to my Jesus. And I can say my Jesus because he's mine. It's personal. That was a personal decision that I made. Amen. Back to 14. How 14 here. 1 Peter 4 and 14. Go. Here we are. We're, we're back at verse 14. I said, man, we just read that. But let's focus in here. It says this. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, that's important. Okay. Now we know the word reproach is just it's just to be insulted. It, it just to, it, it, it means to be insulted and mistreated solely based on your association with Jesus Christ. Right? And I, I don't know about you. I, I've been laughed at plenty of times in Starbucks because I'm sitting there with my Bible reading. Doesn't bother me. It used to. I even had a, a long time friend that I was friends with in high school. Man, you really believe that? Yes, I really do. I believe it. Amen, and I'm going to live it. I believe it, and I'm going to live it. Here's the thing. If you reproached for the name of Christ, guess what it says there? You're blessed. Come on, church, you're blessed. If you reproach for the name of Christ, if, 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 if you reproach for doing what is right, suffer for God's glory, Scripture says you are blessed. This is not a general blessing. Look how specific it says. Look how blessed you are. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That's your blessing. And church, that's a great blessing to have. That, that is a great, God's presence is going to rest on you. It's going to strengthen you in the midst of your pain and your suffering. Man, that's, that's a blessing. And it says there, that, that, that those that are not of Christ, guess what they do? They blaspheme. But what does that say for those of us that are our Christ? It says this right here. Jesus should always be glorified among those who believe and follow him. See, church, you got to be what, what you're putting out there, amen? What you glorifying. What you, I'm not the social media police, but I do see it. So, so that what you posting will tell who you glorify. Amen? And sometimes it don't line up with what you say you are and who you say you follow. That's not for me to judge. That's between you and your creator. But here's what I do know. The book of James says for me to know what to do and not do it is sin. And as a believer in Christ, I'm going to confront it lovingly. We got to call that out. So if you're a believer and follow Christ, for you to sit by and watch sin and not confront it, that's on you. We got to confront that. Every time Jesus faced sin, he confronted it. And he did it lovingly, not to condemn, but to convict and turn around. That's what it is. I know this, praise and the pain is possible when you see that you share something with Christ. Amen. Christ suffered. Church, you partake in his suffering. Praise in the pain is possible when you realize you share something with Christ. And when you and I suffer, we don't suffer alone. We suffer with him. 1 Peter 4 and 15 says this. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Uh-oh. Oh, Pastor Mike, you're ready to get me. Right? I mean, think about this. What, this. what this verse says here is, here's the thing. Not every difficulty you face in life is suffering. You get that? It doesn't qualify as suffering. It, 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 it doesn't really qualify as a fiery trial, right? 
Some difficulties are just a part of life and everyday things that happen, and that's the way they are. It's not a fiery trial. And here's the thing. We got to quit giving Satan too much credit because we like to say everything we go through and everything that's wrong that we don't agree with. Boy, I can't Satan did that. No, you did it. You stepped over into that. Amen? And quit giving him so much credit. You know, here's, here's the thing you got to realize. When you suffer as an evildoer, what you're doing is you're bringing shame on Jesus' name. And you're supposed to be a follower of Christ. That's shameful. You bring a shame on Jesus' name. Here's the thing. I love it. He, he, says, he says all of those as a murderer, as a thief, an evildoer. And here, get this. Don't miss this. I love that Peter put in there a busy body in other people's matter. Can I give y'all something free this morning? Get out of other people's business. Amen? When it don't involve you. Because here's how the rumor mill works, man. Oh, you hear about such and such? I'm, I got to call them see what happened. You want to get at the end. Quit being a busybody in other people's business. Because here's the fact of the matter. You need to find out your own business before you get in somebody else's. Amen? If you can't handle your own affairs, why are you in somebody else's? Quit being a bit. And here's the thing. You don't have to be in the know for everything. You know, Jesus did have 12 disciples, right? And then there was what? An inner circle of three. Them other nine didn't get to see things that those three got to see. So not everybody in your circle deserves to know everything intimately about you. Man, I can't believe they said this about me. Well, who'd you tell? And when you trace that back, you'll find out. Quit telling that person. Amen? 1 Peter 4, 16 says this. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Church, you don't have to be ashamed to suffer. When you go through hard times, don't be shameful. Don't, don't have that attitude that I'm a Christian, everything's right. Nothing ever good. No, it's, don't be ashamed when you suffer for what is right. Now, when you suffer for what is wrong and, and doing evil things, that's on you. But what I love about this, it doesn't matter what kind of suffering you go through. It doesn't matter why you're suffering. You're still to glorify God in it. Amen? Doesn't matter who inflicted it. It doesn't matter. And that term, it says that term Christian. I love this. Where did Christian come from? I mean, Acts eleven twenty-six 26 says this. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. See, we, we got it. The, the, the term Christian then, it, 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 was, it was people that was associated with Jesus Christ. Can we say the same thing today? Amen? Can you say the same thing today in your life that if somebody looks at you and they thinks the term Christian, they think of somebody that's associated and believes and follow Jesus Christ? Not because of a shirt you have on. Not because of a necklace you have on that's a cross. Not because of a, a, a tattoo you got on your arm that's a cross. You, you can have all these outer markings. What does this say? Amen? Here we go, 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. We're getting there. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Love how Peter does this here. And you got to know context, okay? It's, it's key for context. If we don't get context here, we miss this. You got to think of this where judgment is in context of suffering, okay? And, and God's going to drive something home here. And he says this in the context of suffering, judgment begins at the house of God. This is not judgment as in condemnation. This is judgment here means to purify to purge, to cleanse, to get things out that don't belong. And it all happens by the hand of a loving God. Amen? I mean, that's what this judgment is here. Judgment here is in a positive sense. But what you can't miss is the reality of the application here. 
What about those who are enemies of God? What about those who, who don't have any hope? What about those who live by the ways of the world? See, you and I, we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. But life is still hard, church. It's still hard. The righteous one is scarcely saved. Yes, you're saved, but life is still hard. It's no easy task. Is your salvation hard? That's what David Guzik said about that. He said this, Our salvation is hard in the sense that the claims of discipleship challenge us and demand that we cast away our idols and our sins. Amen? Cast away your idols and your sins. See, idol can be more than the little statue you think. Okay? Anything that takes the place of God as the priority in your life, that's an idol. And I know this. Praise in the pain is possible when you know that pain is not in vain. Amen? Everything you go through in this world is not in vain. And our last verse here. Second to last. First Peter 4.19 says this. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as the faithful creator. Church, there's a difference in the will of God and there's a difference in not will of God. There's a difference in doing things the way God has called you to do them and being obedient and there's a difference in being obedient to the world. There's a difference in glorifying self there's a difference in glorifying God. Not all suffering is the will of God. Because sometimes we bring a lot of suffering on our own selves. And here's what these people did that suffered according to the will of God. Look at that word there said, of God, they committed their souls to him in doing good. See, encounter, that's what it looks like to have people that are all in. Who suffer according to the will of God, commit their souls to him in doing good. In church, there's nobody in your life that will ever be more faithful than your creator. Amen. You can, be, you can count on his faithfulness. It will never fail. But that word commit in the Greek, it, 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 it means this right here, to leave money on deposit with a trusted friend. Jesus used that same word when he said this right here, Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. See, Jesus was committed. Church, we have to be committed. Who or what are you committing your life to? And as we close out, Praise in the pain is possible when you commit your entire life to God and the doing of good. Amen? I know it's hard. I know it's hard to, to, to think about that. I know it's hard. You, you, don't, you don't understand, Pastor Mike. You don't understand. My, my relationship didn't go the way I thought it would go. My friendship didn't work out how I thought it would work out. It just didn't go how. That, that hurts. Let me tell you this. The Creator of the universe sacrifice his son for you. That hurts. God can identify that. You got to give that to him. Let's stand.